Hello and welcome to the Hacking State Podcast. This is your host, Alex Mershak. With me today is Zero HP Lovecraft. Zero, uh, welcome back. Oh, it's good to be back. It's, it's so good to have you and to uh, have a chance to speak once again. Um, so I reached out to you this time because I wanted to talk to you about an an essay series that you have, um, or really it's a podcast recording, but I, I read the, the essay components. Um, that is a proposal for a Christo Nietzschean synthesis as its capstone. Um, and for those of you who are just hearing about this for the first time, um, Zero begins with the first uh, installment by going through what he calls the components of religious experience, which we'll probably cover briefly. The second installment covers uh, what he describes as the American civic religion. And the third and final piece is the Christo-Nietzschean synthesis, uh, which we're going to get into in depth today as the capstone of this argument. Um, but the first two pieces are sort of essential to understanding the final piece. Um, and so it's worth reviewing them in brief. And to get into that, Zero, I just wanted to ask you, um, how did you decide to start going down the rabbit hole on the components of religious experience and what are they? Well, to be honest, it, it was just uh, something that I couldn't resist thinking about. I mean, uh, I have a strong interest in religion. I grew up a uh, Christian, kind of a weird sect of Christianity, if I'm honest. Uh, but it doesn't really matter so much I think where where I started because mm. I was, you know, even as a youth, I was very sort of troubled by the, the propositions contained within religion. I could never really just accept, oh, these things are true unequivocally. Like it always seemed to me that uh, the entire way that I engaged with religion and interacted with it is I would sort of uh constantly question it. I could never really just accept any of the things that were taught. And I, I was, you know, very devout for many years and I uh, was baptized and I went to church and I prayed and sang songs and tithed and participated in fellowship. I read many Christian books. I read the Bible. Uh, you know, I was I was uh, in every way a devout and, and practicing Christian. But mm. at no point did I ever really feel comfortable with any of that that I just sort of believed or just had faith. And I prayed about that too, um, as you're supposed to do, right? When I talk to uh, pastors and church elders and, and so on about this. And I I know I know the arguments, I know the advice, like I, I understand I have lived it, but it just never sat with me. And so I didn't really base this series or these thoughts on any any external reading that I did is really more me reading my, at least the first part and the kind of composition of religious experiences I see it mm. is something that I produce by reading myself, not by reading anyone else. And I think that's pretty, I'm not saying the thoughts in it are completely original or unique to me, but it is, it's my own work, it's my own thought for whatever that's worth. Um, and Really, it's just a question of observation, of looking at, you know, because when I eventually put down Christianity and I tried a little bit of new atheism and I didn't sit too well, and I tried Buddhism and I didn't really sit too well either. And uh, then I encountered Nietzsche finally. Mm -hmm. And Nietzsche, you know, he he doesn't really teach a particular faith and he's very much against Christianity. He's sort of against all religion in a way. But I couldn't help but notice that whether whether I was looking at sort of one of these big religions uh, like Buddhism or Christianity or even something much smaller like online pickup artistry, for example, uh, that there's sort of the same you find the same relationship, in my opinion, to the different concepts in your mental ecosystem. And there's, I, I think, I claim 
but there's always some piece of knowledge in pretty much everyone's thinking that they think sets them apart. And I talk about this a little bit in the series that sometimes mm. that piece of knowledge is actually anti knowledge, sometimes it's quite mundane. There are people who, well, I'll just, I'll just give you the components really briefly and then we can kind sure. of come back to it and then look at uh, some maybe less obvious uh, instances of it. So I, I gave them all kind of Greek names or at least names with Greek roots. Not entirely. I tried to make it somewhat linguistically pleasing. So there is what I call Gnosis, which is the life-changing hidden knowledge. The Nemesis, which is the enemy who wants to hide it from you, the knowledge, or destroy you, destroy something. Something pretend you have the knowledge. So I'm this of the Gnosis. Uh, ecstasy, which is the transcendent mental states that are given to the elect. So people who have the gnosis, who have the knowledge, are able to access some kind of different consciousness in some way, which I refer to as ecstasy. There's also taboos, which are forbidden actions. So anyone who has the gnosis understands that there are certain things you must avoid. And uh, then there's eschatology, which is a model of how the world will end. And then there's uh, telos, a prescription for how to spend. Now, this one is complicated. This one is, is not as clean as the others. I call yes. it a prescription for how to spend your surpluses beyond the necessity of survival. We can come back to that one in a minute. But yeah, I, I, I kind of I kind of thought of Telos as like works, basically. Hmm. Um, you know, yeah. what you should be doing in the meantime while you're waiting for the eschaton. Right. That's a, that's a good way of putting it. And I, I especially emphasize it's what you do beyond necessity mm. it's uh it's what is the end goal that's what telos means right it means purpose right so it's not just you know everyone regardless of, of their beliefs or their sort of mental world they have to do things they have to sleep they have to eat they mostly have to procreate uh and and you know there's just a lot of banal uh contingencies in life that everyone has to go through but then there's this question of, okay, well, so you've, you've momentarily met all of those requirements. Now, what are you supposed to do? And so that's, yeah, works. I, I, I think of it as purpose. So if you're a Christian, you might think the purpose is to glorify God, or maybe it's to save other souls or some combination of those things. Perhaps mm -hmm. maybe you think your highest calling is to glorify God by saving souls. That's, that's not extremely important to me, but I wanted to, I came up with a concept that could cover evangelism, which I think is really, really critical to many, but not all religious practices, but which can also cover something like for who this is actually the telos is sitting quietly facing a wall and exploring like your kind of inner uh, subjectivity, right? But I, I see both of those things as purpose in a sense. Mm, okay, so you come up with this framework. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting was just tr just trying to take various uh, ideological factions, pseudo-religious groups and affiliations, and applying the, the six-part component analysis and seeing if you can find good, uh, appropriate parallels in them. And it's it's it seems to be, at least um, upon initial inspection, relatively robust. <laughs> Um, it, it was, yes, I mean, it's it's definitely a product of a lot of thought that I put into it, but yeah. I also noticed that some practices may be missing one element, maybe even two elements uh, in some cases, and when there is a missing element, that's a person who's missing one element in their understanding, in their practice, that's when they're sort of most susceptible to conversion to something else. Mm, so, okay, you know, so... I, I think you actually need that. You need yeah, yeah, so... Things. One sort of through line for this entire series, and I would encourage anyone listening to this conversation, if, if we're if you're not tracking it entirely, please go uh, check it out yourself, is that nature abhors a vacuum, right? And, and so another thing to state, which we haven't uh, done yet in this interview, is that you're taking a functionalist approach. Um, and so the entire framework that you're constructing around religion and the purpose 
of the American civic religion and the purpose of the Christo Nietzschean synthesis is to fulfill some sort of unmet need or drive or desire in human psychology, correct? Yeah, that's that's a pretty accurate summary. So it's funny, I was I was arguing with the uh, about this with someone who I'd rather not name, uh, but he is someone online. And uh, he said, you can't just take a functionalist approach to religion. You can't just pick it apart and and taxonomize it. And I said, why not? I absolutely can. I, I can and I will, in fact. And so people get really angry when mm. I do this a lot of the time, especially when I kind of first had introduced the concept on my Twitter account. This was actually six years ago now. Uh, you know, I go through a list of what I think constitutes like the gnosis for a series of many, many religions or for a series of or what I think constituted the nemesis. And uh, some people found this to be upsetting or challenging because they said, okay, well, if you list off all of these, then what's, what's your gnosis? What's your nemesis, right? As if mm -hmm. it's like they can't conceive of taking an outside view. So I, when I produce this taxonomy and when I, when I try to kind of pick these things apart, I'm actually attempting to do it in a, a way which is as neutral as possible, as polar as possible. I'm not endorsing any perspective. I'm not attempting to say, look, because I can taxonomize these things, because I can list them all out, therefore they're all false. And I think there is an unspoken assumption that some people have that if you can take an outside view of these things, that you're necessarily endorsing yet some other perspective, which is maybe not covered by them. And that's really not my intention at all. Like, I think people find lots of fulfillment and, uh, you know, meaning and purpose in all of these, more or less in all of these systems. Too. Yeah, it sort of reminds me of the um, uh, atheist uh you know, conception of uh, the relationship of God to science, which is that sort of like once you've uh, picked apart the world and analyzed it, uh, once you've, you know, assessed nature on its own terms and you didn't find God in there, that it must mean that God is missing <laughs> because sort of like the act of analysis itself is uh, is kind of sacrilege and it demystifies it in a certain way. And I think that's sort of the knee-jerk reaction a lot of uh, at least religious people or it's explicitly religious people are having to this yes and I, I think that they don't like the assertion that and it, it seems strange to say this but i think they don't like the assertion that religion is fulfilling a psychological need for them uh, as, as strange as that may sound because like you can find in any religion people will say exactly that and it does that right that this that god is fulfilling you know a need that you have but if I, if I frame it materialistically, if I say, yes, you have these sort of needs, which are essentially of the brain and of the body that are fulfilled by, by uh, your understanding of God, it's because that language isn't sympathetic to their metaphysical understanding that it, it may feel like an attack, even though it's not. Right, they're not mutually exclusive. Is, Exactly. And it, it really falls, I think, down to each religious person to explain why is it, you know, if your truth is true, that other people with radically different truths also seem to be able to function, to exist as a society, to, you know, uh, thrive, even to flourish. Like, you, you cannot claim that whatever, maybe you think all the other religions are false, fine. So those religions are doing something. To, to the people who participate in them quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. So the framework uh, outlined in the first piece um, gives us, an, uh, you know, one way to begin uh, picking apart religions and interpreting various things. Um, we're going to move sort of quickly through this next part because we want to get to the Christo Nietzschean synthesis. Um, but the next piece is the American civic religion and the way uh, in which you describe the kind of secular, um, although a Christian derived religion that most, you know, liberals, progressives, whatever you would like to call them, um, are adherents to today. And even many who would self identify as not liberal or not progressive, kind of do just as a result of the ether, 
um, you end up absorbing this, this sort of value system. And it actually takes some amount of thought and work, not just contrarianism to, uh, to begin, you know, in earnest breaking out of it. Um, but would you like to briefly go over the American civic religion? One of the things I'll just note before you, you get into it is that it's often described by people who are trying to call like, say, wokeness, for example, a religion as a zombie religion, as a zombie religion, a zombie manifestation of the original American civic religion, which is sort of like Thanksgiving, the Constitution, and so on and so forth. But one of the interesting things that you make the case for in the second piece is that the American civic religion today is actually much more alive than the um, than the traditional American religion, as unpleasant as that might sound to many conservatives. Yeah, people say the wokeness is a religion. That I don't we don't hear that as often now as we used to. It's not as, it's not like trendy anymore. But it was, uh, of course, I think we all remember a pretty popular slogan for a bit. And people can sort of choose to interact with that by demanding that it is true or that it isn't true. But in my opinion, arguing over that really glosses over all the, the actually interesting questions because yeah. what is a religion? And obviously, maybe not obviously, what, what most people do when they encounter a statement like this is they run the concept of wokeness as they understand it against their personal idiosyncratic understanding of religion and I, I, would, I would argue that there are almost as many understandings of this word religion as there are people everyone's definition is going to be a little bit different the world looks a little different to each person we do think that there are you know sort of roughly shall we say transcendent concepts that words point at kind of but the way that words point at those concepts, even that is a contentious assertion to some people, but the way that words point at those concepts is not configured exactly the same in everyone's head. We all have a slightly different view of the world, a different mapping between language and concepts. So I think it's really silly to engage in an argument like, is wokeness or religion? I think it's much better to be able to say very precisely what, at least what I mean when I'm talking about it. And that's a big part of the motivation for this functionalist definition. Because if you define religion as, you know, a featherless biped, then mm -hmm. some people are going to, like, you're going to exclude many things, right? It's, it's a very limited definition. It's much, it's much better to try to come up with, well, first off, when you look at many things that are widely agreed to be religions and look at what these they have in common and to try to come up with a definition which is actually useful. Now you could argue that my six components do not constitute a religion, that there's some seventh component or eighth or who, who knows what. And I think what many religious people would do, and I've seen people do this, they'll say, yes, well, okay, that's all well and good, but what you're missing is the fact that one of them is actually inspired by God. Okay, lovely. I, I, I support you in your belief that that is the case. However, uh, that is not a useful. Um, that's not a useful metric, at least for my for my purposes of analysis. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Um, there, there is a, an impetus when describing the American civic religion, especially the the latest iteration. I sort of think of it like software. They're always issuing new patches kind of all the time. And we can yeah. uh, we can think of some some recent updates. I'm sure everyone <laughs> remembers the 2020 patch, which caused many cities to catch on fire. That you know, in the software yeah. phase, we is it is it a feature, feature or a bug? <laughs> indeed. indeed. Um okay, it so really depends on your use case. One of the things that sort of uh, and we will get into a little bit of the American civic religion. Um, maybe we won't talk about their idols too much, but um, one of the things that's sort of a an out a way, there are many parallels between Christianity uh, and the original American civic religion and the new civ American civic religion. But one of the largest sort of threads is 
what I would call runaway equality, um, which is that, you know, <laughs> you get out of Christianity uh, equality before God and you get out of the American civic religion, uh, all men are created equal. And both of these statements are superficially very straightforward. But if you begin to investigate how they uh, are meant to interact with the reality that faces you, which does not reflect them at all, um, you start to ask some very interesting questions about how to make those two, uh, how to make that dissonance compatible. And um, one of the results of this is that the original ways in which that dissonance was supposed, was intended to be made compatible gets forgotten over time. And so one thing that constitutes the American civic religion is that this leveling force, um, as Nietzsche would call it, um, just continues to expand further and further out of the bounds of its original circumscription. Yes, I, I have no, uh, no dispute with that. I think that's entirely accurate. Yeah, so um, given that that's the case, I, I guess one of the things that Christians are going to start wincing at um, as we begin to move into the Christian Nietzschean synthesis itself is this concept that the current American civic religion is, a, is I would say you're making the case a derivative of Christianity. Is that right? I, I would claim that, yes. Now, I don't... There are limits to how rigorous you can be in, in what I'm about to say next. And I sort of talk about this, I hint at it a little bit, but I ultimately chose not to focus on it in the actual series we're talking about, partly because there are limits to how rigorous it can be. But I do sort of conceive of, uh, of belief systems like organisms. So I think that they change, they mutate, they descend with mutation over time. And uh, you can see many examples of that because as new uh, people are born and they learn the tenets of a belief and they attempt to reconcile what they believe with what they observe, with their personal life, you know, their, their faith finds a new expression uh, in their circumstances. And so as our circumstances change, partly it's just drift, partly it's just people are a little bit different and genetic drift occurs, partly it's that there are real events in the world which may be dissonant with what people believe and which causes them to adjust their beliefs uh, over time, over generations. I think that faith evolves and mutates just the same way that, uh, that biological organisms do. And to some degree, it's constrained by biology. Like I think that the Christian, this is another thing that's contentious, of course, but the, the Christianity of, say, an English person or a German person or a French person, someone with Western European heritage, and especially like it's, it's honestly pretty regional, even, is actually pretty different from the Christianity of, say, a Chinese person. Not that there are that many Chinese Christians, but there are, they exist, or mm -hmm. the Christianity of a, of a person from the Philippines or in South America, in, you know, we, we think about or African Christianity, I think they're all quite different. I think that there is, um, and Christians and other religious people as well, like people of most faiths, mostly have to disavow this, this assertion. Right? There is a complicated interplay between biology and belief. There are certain beliefs that can sit in certain people's heads, and then there are many beliefs that cannot. And so when you try to take a, a belief system that mm -hmm. evolved, shall we say, in the Middle East, uh, like something like uh, Judaism, for example, yeah. and then you try to force it into different, uh, different biological containers, it changes. And one, that could be one partial explanation for how you get Christianity, and that could be one explanation for why Christianity looks so different in so many places. It's not just a mix of local customs. There is that. You think about how in a lot of Latin American countries, it mixes with these local folk religions. You end up with, like, even, you know, uh, Mexican 
Catholics, they also sort of keep some of their older holidays. There's these this Day of the Dead and some of this kind of more, more new world religion that's mixed in as you go further south and you start to see these things that they're not biblical. They're not, I would say, they're not recognizable as European Christianity. That's the flavor, that's the shape that Christianity takes as it goes there. And similarly, I think you could maybe make the case for why uh, Protestantism occurred in Germany. Like the the Roman Catholicism that they have, people will say, oh, it's political, it's really driven by money, it's driven by ethnic grievance. Maybe, yes, all of that is true. But a big piece of that, why is it, why is there ethnic grievance? Why is politics, why does it take the shape it does? Because ultimately, a lot of it is hereditary, a lot of it's shaped by families, a lot of it's shaped by the nature of the people in the place. Protestantism, you could say, was in many ways um, a biological outpouring of Christian faith as it, as it struck the German people. It made more sense to them, they fit them. So biology constrains what faith is possible, even at the same time that it's not as if there's exactly one doctrine that can sit in a German person's head or in a, an English person's head, right? Mm -hmm. There's a range of possibilities. Right. So, so faith evolves within the range of possibilities, but is constrained by biology. Yes. And the differences uh, among faiths uh, that go by the same name um, in different locales is one of the many uh, contradictions that we will discuss. We already briefly touched on the contradiction of the, uh, of the equality of all people. And this uh, theme of contradiction and the role that contradiction plays, it's actually a very powerful mechanism. Uh, if you, you can almost think of it like two magnets that are repelling each other. <laughs> um, it's something that we will, we will also be getting into as well. Um, so I guess to start, since we are already discussing Christianity and its, its constraints in, in biology and other ecological factors, um, you said that if we operate inside a functional frame, I'm quoting you here, uh, then we recognize that the name a group gives to itself doesn't matter nearly as much as the pattern of their thought process, their mode of existence, the form of their integration with being in the dynamics of their actions. Um, and with respect to Christianity, um, there's sort of an interesting, uh, you know, one thing that obviously you've already pointed out is that you will, it, you will note that there are many Christians in many different parts of the world and the way that they actually act as Christians is quite different. And yet they all are under this umbrella that seems to have some kind of universal appeal. And so what is it that Christians actually believe? Um, and one of the things that you discuss is this, uh, this uh, evolution or gain of function almost inside of Christianity, where God is increasingly abstracted. And this, uh, this is in contrast to uh, more primitive religions or tribal religions where the gods are personified and they are confined to, you know, very local spaces and uh, they have circumscribed roles and they act in very human ways. And Christian Christianity, uh, increasing abstraction of God as an impersonal entity, as something far away from you, as something distant, um, does a number of uh, performs a number of useful operations, but one of which is allowing it to to sort of flow through different uh, substrates like water. Yes. Um, so maybe I don't. To be honest, it's been a while since I wrote this, and I've been in a pretty different headspace. But I think I could probably raise this point that the further away. God gets, and I spent quite a bit of time sort of expounding on this idea of the divine distance. Mm. Is the it's the distance between God and man? You don't. I don't think. Correct me if I'm wrong. You, uh, if you believe in God, you probably don't think that Jesus is uh, hanging out on Earth. You know, around you, you don't see him physically. You might think he lives in your heart. That's an abstract thing that that people will say, but they. 
in some ways that's hiding that's hiding God in a place that no one can look, is what I claim. But this this idea of the divine distance is like, okay, the more powerful you make God, the more eternal you make God, the more uh you know omniscient you make God, the less relatable, the less visible he is in your everyday life. And people will like I do think Christians bridge this gap in a, in a variety of ways and with a variety of tricks. They pray together and they feel, again, we talk about the ecstasy as one of these six components. There are many ecstatic experiences which Christians can access. And I don't just mean uh, snake handling and speaking in tongues and some of these sort of more extreme things that you see in maybe like uh, the charismatic churches. I'm talking about something which is a lot more, a lot more subdued, but still yeah. very real when you go to church and you, uh, you know, you basically meditate deeply on God's word. You might read the word with a lot of reverence, and a particular Bible verse will strike you, or um, you know, a line from a hymn or something a preacher says, and you might just have this sort of moment where you almost step outside of yourself. And this is a very normal thing that I think any any Christian who is, who is sincere probably has experienced in some form or another. And then they will point at that and say, that was God. That was God's presence. That was God, you know, speaking to me, through me. But again, I'm not here to dispute that necessarily. That's, that's a way that Christians try to bridge the gap and kind of reclaim that distance. But despite those experiences, those sort of ecstatic experiences, when you try to apprehend God a little more, shall we say, currently a little more, uh, like big picture, zoom out, look at the, look at the whole thing, you, you get a very, very different God than someone like Zeus or Odin, who you think is probably running around, you know, turning into a horse and impregnating, uh, like the, the local uh, maidens. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I still think that Odin's doing that all the time. You see what I'm saying? Probably so. Probably so. Um, maybe he is, uh, what's this fellow's name? Maybe he is incarnated in the person out of uh, Bard. I'm sorry, I don't know how you say his name. Bard, Bard Vickers. Vickers. <laughs> yeah, Vickers. Vickers. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's Odin. I don't know. Not that's a favorite of a certain infamous homosexual to say. Right. Uh, yeah, so, so this idea of the divine distance. Let's see. Mm -hmm. um, I've got this further away. I claim other things move in to fill the gap. Right. Basically, right. You, you pick something closer that starts to function as God. Okay. Okay. Yes. And, you know, honestly, we're probably not going to do this, this exact concept, the divine distance justice in this conversation, because it's quite a complicated idea. Um, and in fact, I mean, when I was reading it uh, in your post, I thought like this could be its own whole, uh, you know, exposition, uh, just getting your wrapping your head around the implications of it and how it works functionally and so on and so forth. Um, but the, I, I guess one of the things we haven't really said out loud right now is what the purpose of a Christo Nietzschean synthesis is, right? And you sort of you, you you open the discussion by sort of acknowledging that you know a lot of Christians aren't going to like bringing Nietzsche into their house, and a lot of Nietzscheans aren't going to are going to think it's fake and gay to have Christianity coming in. Um, and so, why are we bringing these things together? This sort of points at the 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 contradiction engine that we're trying to create. Right. So yeah, maybe to give a little more context there, something I explain is that most, probably all religious thought that's that's animating to people rests on some contradiction somewhere. And that's not a weakness, that's not a problem, that doesn't invalidate it like the opposite. It strengthens it because you end up living uh, in relation to concepts that are incompatible, and that forces you to be creative, and that forces you to be dynamic, and it creates tension. It's something to strive against. This creates purpose. And I generally point out the concept of the Trinity in Christianity, which is 
very much a contradiction that there are and, and many, many other contradictions flow from that. And again, I don't claim that the fact that there is something inherently contradictory about it invalidates it. I think it's a source of strength. And so when I approach the concept of can we synthesize Christ and Nietzsche, immediately there is a contradiction. There is something irreconcilable between those two things. But I say that does not have to be a weakness. That can, in fact, be a strength, just as the contradiction of the Trinity is a strength for Christianity. But mm. as to the question of why, I think maybe my answer here is not terribly satisfying or not terribly convenient. I will claim, I claim in the text that part of it is that Christianity blooms written inextricably in the DNA of the West. If we talk about Western civilization, if we talk about, like supposedly, we all care about that, that abstraction of Western civilization and what it means to be sort of like in this heritage, which we draw between the ancient Greeks and the Romans and all the way to, to present day America. And we claim that there's some continuous intellectual tradition that spans through the enlightenment, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, and the Renaissance to us now. And when we talk about all of that, when we talk about the West, I say it cannot possibly exist without Christianity. Um, right. The form that Christianity takes is, is more open for interpretation, but it has to be there. If you get rid of, if you try to just erase it, if you try to remove Christianity, well, you're sort of lobotomizing yourself uh, in terms of the past. How are you really going to understand Shakespeare, how are you going to understand Milton? Mm -hmm. How are you going to understand, uh, you know, um, even some of the Kierkegaard? You can't do it. You can't do it because the Christianity is so baked into every single part of this thing, of this stack in this history. So maybe. How are you going to understand feminism? <laughs> Indeed, indeed. Maybe from a Nietzschean perspective, that alone is enough to say, well, I shouldn't I shouldn't just try to throw this away. Maybe it's not. Uh, I, I think I think it could be. I find it impulse. Um for the question mm. I spend a lot of time talking about, and I think I explained this in, in the talk itself. I talk about this. Uh, what I call the Christianity the shredder. The Christianity shredder is inability of Christianity to reconcile itself to um, not even not just modern sexual norms, which is not really a reason you should reconcile yourself to that per se, but just to make there's a very uneasy piece with the body, with eroticism in general, which mm -hmm. is consistently a tension, but not in a way that's a source of strength. It causes Christianity for many people to falter as it becomes increasingly difficult to make the case for the sexual purity that it has evolved. And I'm not saying, oh, you should throw away sexual purity. I'm not saying you should be promiscuous or, or you know, degenerate or anything like this. I'm certainly not producing an apologetic for, you know, uh, polyamory or homosexuality or any of those things. But, mm -hmm. I think that, again, because belief systems evolve over time, because they mutate and they descend and they are modified, there's drift, I think that Christianity has lost the ability to grapple with the fact that uh, we exist in, in two planes at once. From yeah. The, from the Christian framework. We, we, go ahead. Well, I, I was going to say, like, um, you know, so to, for those of you who haven't caught on quite yet, um, the point of bringing Nietzsche in, in in conjunction with Christianity is to strengthen Christianity. And why does Christianity need to be strengthened? Because it's weak. It is weak and decrepit. Um, I spoke to a Christian uh, last week, um, just as a about Christianity in America, and you know he was a young man. He's a, as far as I am aware, a, a pretty devout Christian. He genuinely believes in the faith. He wants to uh, proselytize others. He's trying his best as a young man living in, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, 
living in you know this this decadent culture to live up to his Christian ideals, and yet in our conversation together, it was. Uh, it was almost as if I needed to like pick him up and give him encouragement that like uh, that, 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 that like the faith was strong enough. I was, I was taken aback at how weak um, this, uh, this Christian was that I was speaking to. And I don't mean any offense by it. Uh, if, if he ends up hearing this, which, he, which he might um, it, it's just the Christians are totally uh, they're totally defanged. They have no, uh, real spirit left in them to to even fight. They don't even have the will to fight, really. Um, and so the point of this project is actually to strengthen Christianity um, or, or to reinvigorate it, rather. Um, and the basis of this is one of the Nietzschean principles that you talk about a few times in this piece, which is that if you want to strengthen something, attack it, right? You attack what you want to make stronger. How much of that kill me makes me stronger in a very famous Nietzschean utterance. Mm -hmm. Right. Also immortalized in the Conan movie in 1982. Right. Um, and so you briefly touched on this issue of sex and sexual relations as one of the weaknesses that Christianity has in the face of the modern world. There are others. There's technological components. There's obviously the whole evolution debate. Um, which is ongoing and Christians are, I think, getting better at making themselves more compatible with that. But um, you said that sex and sexual norms is one of the ways in which um, the, the civic, the American civic religion, that is the, uh, the successor religion to Christianity in the West, um, manages to sort of get converts and gets them young. How does that work exactly? Yeah, that's, Honestly, I, I feel like this was such a delicate thing to write about. Like, I, I actually, I probably spent more time writing that piece of the essay than anything else, just because you have to walk very carefully. Uh, everyone kind of has their own very strong opinions and, and beliefs about it. And there's a lot of tripwires that I try to avoid when talking mm -hmm. about this, because obviously, maybe not obviously, Christianity has a huge focus on uh, sexuality being within marriage, right? You're not supposed to have premarital sex. You're not supposed to have sex outside of marriage. And that's absolutely great. Those are great rules that people should follow. But what marriage is and how it is expressed in society and how it works and how, how people think about it is not compatible, frankly, with this Christian ideal. So something has to give. And for the most part, that thing ends up being Christianity. And I talk a little bit about this, how for some people, it gives in a way where they retain this sense of Christianity, this understanding of themselves as Christian, but they completely throw away any concern around the sexual morality of it. They probably just don't even feel guilty about their sexual transgressions anymore. That's one way uh, that that can go. Another way is people say, well, I don't feel guilty and I don't find that these beliefs were helping me, so they just throw it away completely. And so you end up with a lot of left and left liberal Christians uh, on the one hand who think that women should be pastors and, uh, you know, they, you see this. I When I go to any basically place with churches in it, I see signs proclaiming mm -hmm. how much they love the gays and the transsexuals and everything. Right, and everyone right. Loves them. Which, say, of course... Everyone, everyone, I... I'm certain I would not be welcome if I were to tell you what I think about that. Right, right, which is which is very funny, which is very funny if you think about it. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm not, and by pointing this out, by saying that this happens and explaining it, I'm not endorsing it. I'm not saying, oh, it's good that this thing happens. I'm not saying it ought to be this way, but it is what happens. And I think Christians very much struggle to to process it. Many of them are in denial. They think, oh, well, you just, you can ignore this problem and it will go away. Meanwhile, as I point out, you see church attendance dropping dramatically. Uh, you know, in the past few decades, you see the number of people who identify as Christians dropping dramatically since, I think, uh, even, if that's an even longer running trend. 
So the churches have to do something. And one thing they can do, which I think a few churches have figured out, is to actually be very fanatical and very zealous and just condemn everything uh, in uncompromising terms. And some people respond to that. Some people like it. Mm. Is, there, is there a way for the church to recapture the erotic imagination of the country, which I think would be necessary uh, in order to ever really be able to say America's a Christian nation again. I think yeah, that's, well, that's a much more complicated question. We won't dwell too much on this part of the essay, just partly because the solution is somewhat uh, unsatisfactory. Um, yes. But, uh, you know, one of the one of the, I, I guess, key issues here is that there seems to be some sort of absorb, absorbing barrier where once the seal is broken, it's very hard to, um, for lack of a better term, uh, it's very hard to uh, continue on, right, uh, in earnest with the faith because you've, tra you've made that transgression. And so um, you did say uh, towards the end that the Christian focus is too much on the uh, transgression itself rather than the guilt as a result of it. And one of the things I just thought about when I was reading that was it seems to me, and, and Catholicism is conspicuously uh, absent from most, uh, pretty much all of the, the, the essay. Um, you talk about Protestantism, you talk about other religions as well. Um, but it seems to me like Catholicism actually does have a decent mechanism for dealing with that. What do you think? So this is one area where I, mean, I will confess I was never a Roman Catholic. Um, I, I never really found their expression of Christianity particularly compelling. To me, it, it seems quite alien. In fact, I find it uh, at least as alien as something like Islam to my, my uh, sensibility. When I uh, walk into a Catholic church, I see all these sort of grotesque statues and images and, and this this ostentatiousness, which to me just feels nothing like anything I, I grew up with or found relatable. So I can only really talk about Catholicism in a secondhand way. What I found is that uh, to me, Catholics seem to have an extremely laissez-faire relationship to uh, any kind of rules or works. Like they don't, they're often quite proud, it seems to me, they're proud of the sin, but they don't really, for example, read the Bible. They mm -hmm. must, you know, that's something that the clergy do, the way they don't do that. And then they, they seem to me to, again, they're, they're quite um, free about it, and then maybe they just confess it away. Maybe they see very little contradiction between being sort of culturally Catholic. Uh, you know, they go to Christmas and Easter Mass, perhaps. But then, as far as like the actual way that they live their life, it is seen as much more secular. And there are very pious Catholics, and there's chat caps on the internet. There seem to be groups of people on the internet who are Catholic who do not exist in real life, and I'm not entirely convinced they're real, who are just incredibly um, legalistic and doctrinaire, and, and they, there are very little of them once if you know any like cradle Catholics. It's like they're two different species. So I mm -hmm. see those people as well, and I see them, this is a good example of how there really is not that much unity in the Catholic Church. There are many, many different sects within the Catholic Church, but in Protestantism, when you have a schism, you you name it. You give your sect a new name, and you go off and you found your own church, and you say, okay, well, we've, we've split now, and now they're the reform, you know, version, and we're, we're the, whatever, it doesn't matter. They, they come up with a new name, they get a new building, whatever. Mm -hmm. In Catholicism, when you schism, those groups just insist, we're the real Catholics, and then they're the weirdos. But they both just keep them in Catholic. It's exactly the same dynamic, I think. When, it's like when Bitcoin like forks. There's a Bitcoin fork, and Indeed. we're the real Bitcoin. They're all, they're, all, they're all the real Bitcoin. That's that's my opinion of Catholicism, is that they, they're, 
human is illusory. Uh, there are many, you know, sincere and devout Catholics, just as there are many sincere and devout Protestants, and I have no disrespect for them. But to me, it's just something incredibly alien. Right. Um, okay, so I just I wanted to briefly just just uh, not leave the the question of Catholic confession as a mechanism out because there's a yeah it, it this part of the discussion there's not a great solution it is sort of up to the Christians to figure out what that might be and that's why we're bringing Nietzsche in to um, to pound away at, at stone until it gets sharper um, so let's move on to. Another component of Christianity that sort of has been totally co-opted and used to subvert not only the faith itself, but also a bunch of other uh, things that are necessary for civilization and progress, actual progress, uh, which is the, with his pathological altruism. Um, so Nietzsche is a big fan of uh, hitting Christian on this, uh, Christianity on this point. Um, and you talk a little bit about the ascetic priest, which is, of course, a very Nietzschean figure. Um, that those who've read, you know, Beyond Good and Evil or The Genealogy of Morality uh, would be familiar with. Um, and uh, part of the functionalist approach of religion is integrating this Nietzschean criticism uh, and coming to the realization or the acknowledgement uh, that the ethic of self-sacrifice is actually a weapon. How is self-sacrifice weaponized against others and oneself? I think it's useful to start with how it's working out against yourself, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I think, at least, again, in my personal experience of Christianity, it very much was something that I think uh, limited me and even crippled me in some senses when I when I found it to be agreeable. It's, it's this idea that you, you take a... I, I love this term, Nietzsche uses it, well, at least it's a translation of it from Nietzsche uses a voluptuous pleasure. And Nietzsche says you take a voluptuous pleasure in this kind of, uh, of self-deprivation. Uh, I think to put it in more modern terms is to say that you, you quite deliberately reject greatness. You quite, you, you set aside ambitions. You don't strive to be the best or the greatest. You instead make sort of a big show of handicapping yourself and limiting yourself, and you take more enjoyment in that. Specifically, you you feel self righteous about it. You take guilt, which you might feel for your successes or for 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 being great. You take the guilt that you feel and you twist it up and you make it righteous. And you say in in your own mind, you say that well, I'm I'm good for feeling guilty, and then you hamstring yourself. And you call that goodness, but that's not good. Uh, in the Nietzschean conception, in fact, that is evil. For Nietzsche, it's very straightforward that wealth is good, power is good, strength is good, good things are good. It shouldn't even have to be said. I shouldn't have to sit here and tell you that it's good to be strong. That should be so abundantly clear that it's beyond question. But this is where one of Nietzsche's main points of criticism of Christianity is that they actually say, no, it is bad to be strong. Right. Right. And that's that's the idea of slave morality. It's, uh, you know, the sheep thinks, oh, the wolf is so evil with his teeth and his claws. But the wolf, the wolf isn't evil at all. To, have, to be strong, to have claws, to have teeth is great. And in fact, you cannot be good if you don't have strength. And right. If you, are, if you don't have the power to do evil, you cannot possibly be good. You are just sort of flat. You're just sort of mediocre. Yeah. So this is one of. Yeah, that's, yeah. Well, I was just going to say that this is one of Nietzsche's um, uh, main themes: is the reintroduction of what what is called pagan morality um, into, I, I guess, the discourse, um, which, which, as you said, is the has as one of its. It's core themes that what what increases one's power is good. There is an equivalence between the increase in one's power uh, and and the good itself, and that these are not contradictory. They are not opposites. Um, and so you should be stronger. You should be uh, more magnificent. You should be wealthier. You should be more powerful. And in fact, as you said, uh, you know. Um, 
goodness from a position of weakness is indifferentiable from cowardice. Uh, so you can't tell them apart. Yes, exactly. And so not only does that become a weapon against yourself, but it also becomes a weapon against others because now when someone else aspires to greatness, when they try to do something good, when they try to do something powerful, you would say, now you can take power from them by condemning them in these slave moralistic terms by saying, oh, that person, a strong person, he is selfish, he aggrandizes himself at the expense of the poor, at the expense of the sick, at the expense of the weak, and so on. And this is really, uh, I think, I, I don't, I think everyone gets this. I think everyone on the far right, whether they're Christian or, or pagan or what well, have you, pretty much understand this now that uh, you can very, very easily burn an infinite number of resources trying to uplift the poor, and you will fail. There will always be poor people. There will always be people and sick people. It's not solvable. It's not um, all that you do is stop everyone from aspiring you never actually the numbers. You know, I was having a discussion with some friends last night over dinner about um, about these series of essays and about, you know, what we might discuss today. And the question came up, how do you, like, the question came up is like, well, um, does not every religion or every pseudo-religious ideology have some concept of victimhood? And what is the difference between, let's say, nemesis and vi and, and self-victimization, right? And one of the thoughts that um, I sort of came up with was that um, you know that you're not falling into a victim ideology if it's not trying to use this, uh, if it's not trying to weaponize this component of self-sacrifice or this component of weakness, right? Because the victim-based uh, thought patterns will always attempt to use their own weakness as a cudgel to beat down the strong. And you can still have a nemesis. You can still have an opponent out there that is that you're trying to defeat. But if you're trying to defeat them by becoming stronger than they are in a genuine sense, uh, then you're not a victim. It's only victimization if you are trying to defeat them by throwing it in their face that they don't deserve to be stronger than you. It's, it's the idea that the victims deserve more. The idea that the weak deserve more that I think uh, becomes so corrosive in these cases. So you obviously see this in whenever you talk about weakness or, or affirmative action, diversity, all this, right? The mm -hmm. poor thing is that Whoever is the worst, whoever is the most pathetic, they are the one who should receive the most help, the most benefits, the most attention, and everything like this. And so it then becomes this competition to see who can be the most pathetic. And I see a lot of white people doing this too right. nowadays, arguing about how all the groups that have victimized them and all of the ways that they've been oppressed and so on. And that's just such. You're never going to win by playing that game. The whole point of that game is to lose. And everyone we can all we can all lose together, and then we can sit in the pit of our own. Yes, yes, we can all lose together. That's right, and, and that's not what we want. So it's good to have. It's actually very good to have a nemesis. Uh, I I wouldn't. I'm not going to spend all spill all this ink telling you that. In order to have a complete religious experience, you need to have gnosis and nemesis, and then try to turn around and free you from the cycle of gnosis and nemesis. That would be that would be non sequitur. Uh, if I do that, if I try to construct some kind of anti belief system that didn't have these components, then I would have created something very weak because then someone else would come along and offer you a gnosis or offer you a nemesis, and you'd rather go with that instead. It would be more compelling. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to erase any of these components from, from experience or to create an ideology which somehow doesn't have them. Rather, I'm trying to produce, again, I cannot create some perfect synthesis that's just like, all right, I'm going to tell you the six things, and now you're going to believe them. 
and you're gonna live happily ever after because life isn't static and the world isn't static, it's dynamic. So instead what I try to do is produce a platform mm -hmm. which can hopefully yield uh, a, a compelling set, a compelling functionalist form of other religion that can that can be useful and empowering and not weakening. Right. And so uh you describe the right orientation as a kind of aesthetic um appeal or aesthetic positioning, which is that we want to have a world that is beautiful, where beauty is revered, greatness and heroism are possible, and we're trying to create space, uh, to use a Bapian term, uh, for exceptional people to flourish and prosper. Um is this an inherently this is an inherently right position because of the left's uh, orientation really towards entropy and dissipation as such. Like it seems to me as if all left-wing ideology essentially wants that. Um, and they may confine yes. it to certain realms. If you're like a left libertarian or, or, or you're more like a, a, a left-wing statist, you have different ways and, and different axes on which you're trying to achieve this state. But ultimately, all leftist thought is sort of going towards that um, final final stasis. Yeah, so it's, it's important, I think, to note that the left does not believe that about itself. Um, at least not the older forms of leftism. The newer, the newer ones don't really seem to have much ideological coherence at all. I think if you read the Vatel Hader, you know, The Power of the Powerless, which is one of the most important things that anyone can read to understand our current political landscape. He talked about the way that the ideology eventually becomes sort of senile as it becomes its own epistemic grounding and its own justification for itself. So I think if you look at early forms, even of communism, you know, Trotsky wrote that once, once the the vision of this glorious communist utopia was realized that there'd be a style or sorry, that there'd be a Wagner or a Shakespeare on every corner. Just imagine mm -hmm. that. Because I all know. of the all of the things that are holding us back, all of the oppression, all of the you know hatred and hierarchy that are that are stopping us from realizing this workers' utopia, that's why you and I are not Shakespeare and Wagner. Right, it's it's all the oppression, it's all the capitalism, it's all the wreckers and the saboteurs who who don't believe in our vision and who are oppressing us with hierarchy, and and they really, I think, believe that if they found just the right theory, if they found just the right words, if they really, you know, nailed the dialectic and destroyed all the wreckers, then they would have a communist, you know, a glorious communist utopia, and all you have to do. Is, is get those things right. You have to have the struggle. You have to live in the struggle, and then, then you'll get you'll get this tremendous uplift of men. That's what they used to believe. But then, as ideology starts to fold in on itself, and it starts to destroy any reality, and it starts to become its own arbiter of reality, then it really ceases to even believe in uplift. And the only thing that remains is the struggle, and the struggle of grinding everyone down into the dirt. So I think that there are many left in state who you can find who would still believe in and still endorse that vision of uplift. They may not go as far as, as saying a Wagner and a Shakespeare on every corner, but they do in a sense believe that. You can even find someone like uh, Eric Weinstein. He said, he had this amazing tweet. He said, you can hardly swing a cat without hitting a black genius, okay. uh, which is an amazing tweet because it contains, you know, uh, racism and animal cruelty. Uh, and it's just horrible. It's like it's got so many wonderful things all just packed in this tight layered package. This is true. Uh, you know, we, we didn't even talk about the ordeal of civility yet. But, yeah, yeah. But but so I think someone like uh, I think someone like Weinstein actually does believe in uplift. Like I don't think uh, he necessarily call him a leftist. I, I, I himself, I don't know if I don't know if Eric Weinstein would call himself a leftist, but from where I'm sitting, he is. And 
but he seems to believe it up with anyway. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, th I think there's a lot of leftists that don't really have a good understanding of their own um, worldview or, or really where it ends uh, precisely, um, which is very funny. But it, it, that just tells you that it's more of an affectation um, to some it's extent. Um, the, the there. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I, we, we, we sort of addressed the envy and the resentment um, that's at the heart of this this leveling uh, instinct um and part of overcoming that envy and resentment and part of the reason why we are seeking to bring uh Nietzschean thought together with Christianity uh in this analysis is to regain uh self-possession and you have an interesting formulation um which is that the essence of religion is to gain self-possession by means of self dispossession so what do you mean by that and in what way does self-possession and self-dispossession which leads to self-possession uh free us from the envy and resentment of our baser nature yeah, i think to put it in maybe a more contemporary way a way that, that plays with how people want to really talk uh Self dispossession is, in a way, in a way, is a Christ like concept. It is something that you do see in Christianity that's talked about quite a bit. Like, well, it's, it's in, I mean, I claim it's in all religions, but it's, it's this idea of loss of self. Um, it's loss of ego. It's a giving up of kind of illusion. It's humility. It's, you know, you, you have to live in a world where you understand that you, can be and likely are wrong about some things and maybe even many things. And it's being able to let go of, of that need to be always right, always, always the best, always the strongest. I mean you should you should strive to be strong, right? But it's paradoxical. If you sit around thinking you're the strongest, you definitely aren't. Uh you have to kind of totally give up on, on those uh those petty illusions in order to actually reforge yourself into something great and so i think that's maybe a, a non maybe that's a secular and hopefully succinct explanation of self dispossession and, and in christianity they'll say you know uh that uh, i am crucified in christ right and they say that you uh you are dead to yourself mm -hmm. when you when you uh help them out of Christianity and you know what Christ into your life and so on. There is this is in some ways what baptism is a symbol of, right? You are dying to yourself. And so you can let Christ nature in. That's self-dispossession. In Buddhism, it's more a question of uh letting go of all your earthly attachments. It's the ability to sit in total stillness and let go even of your of your concept of self. And mm -hmm. only once you do that, only once you dissolve the self can you reach enlightenment. So um, I think you find this in, in pretty much every religious practice. How you can find it in people who, who just take psychedelic drugs, right? They're very much into this idea of ego dissolution and loss of self, yeah. and this kind of grand unifying feeling that you have when you take a ton of, of psychedelic drugs. So I don't think psychedelics are a good way to get self dispossession, but they do give you a sense of self dispossession, and only only then once you've reached that state, that paradoxical state of self-dispossession, can you truly begin to take ownership of yourself? That's what self-possession means then as this as this flow to it. It's mm -hmm. when you are uh for lack of a better word, you're confident, you're composed, you have a, a, a grip on yourself, you're the master of your passions rather than the other way around. That's that's the idea. And you can only get self-possession ultimately if you pass through self-dispossession right yeah. yeah the only the only way out is through and you've cleaved yeah. off you've cleaved off every piece of you that is false right um you sort of put yourself you into a you won't do that it's an asymptote but yes i'm sorry i mean you will never actually do that <laughs> well <laughs> yeah 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 yes 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 thing. yes um oh, yes. You, you, that's the you, idea there is a continuous process of um, 
of of refinement, uh, almost as if in a crucible. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about with regard to this concept of self possession through self dispossession, and this I guess would be more salient with uh, with Islam, which I don't know a lot about, um, is this concept of um, of uh, mastery through submission. Right, which is also cited a lot by artists. Right, which is, if you want to create great art, you have to submit yourself to the tradition, to the masters, and then once you've over, once you've uh, fully incorporated their teachings, their lessons, then you have the appropriate degrees of freedom to go on and exceed them, and to yourself take mastery over a craft. There's a very interesting parallel there. Yes, I mean, that's my approach to writing in general. I think it's very good to uh, copy existing works, you know, pretty closely. It's, you're not going to create something bearing an original in a vacuum. Um, all, all creative works ultimately are in dialogue with everything that's come before them. So it can be very, and it's, it's necessary in, in most cases to retrace the steps that brought you to the present moment before you're going to be able to advance. In, in my opinion. Did, have you, what works have you rewritten? Uh, I mean, I don't make any secret of this, but basically all of the stories I write are deeply inspired by, I wouldn't say derivative of the works of Borges, mm -hmm. who is kind of my, uh, my uh, North Star as a writer. So when I write fiction, I generally see what I'm doing as a kind of a footnote to this author who I respect. Mm, okay. I was just curious about that. Um, so we have this concept of the regaining of self-possession, but it's not actually a complete prescription, uh, at least for the religious uh, reconstruction project that uh, this is meant to undertake, um, which is that there also has to be two other components um to this which is a sense of purpose and a set of shared values um and you make the argument that actually one of the ways in which christianity is insufficient for our modern context is that the modern world in some ways returns us to the conditions that were present in primitive religion for those of you who uh, have been listening to this entire conversation it's important to note here that uh there's this interaction between religion and the environment in an ecological sense. And so something like instantaneous communication with everybody around the world all the time, the sort of global, was it the global neighborhood is as, as it's called? Um, the global village, yes. Um, mirrors in some ways the, uh, you know, topography of the conditions in which primitive religions sprung about. What's the relationship between sort of our our interconnectedness and even you know various technological um, uh, changes to the landscape of social and mimetic interactions and the uh, and the the I guess shape of religious experience that fits this environment? This. A big piece of this comes from Marshall McLuhan, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, mm. His idea that as we, he was more talking about radio and television, but you know, I think has only accelerated or continued the trend. But prior to the use of electronic telecommunication, we were mostly a, a written culture, a literate culture. So the main way that information and, and meanings were created was through books, through the written word, through pamphlets, this kind of thing. And uh, that is an anomaly that sort of started around the time the printing press was invented, and it created this new sensory modality that we, especially in the West, existed in this written culture. Whereas uh, what television and radio do and even that as well, is they bring us into an oral culture, a culture where communication is primarily spoken rather than, than read. So, one 
the current claim was that this is not a new sensory modality, this is a return to an older sensory modality. And that is, it sort of fits, it's sort of logical then that the way we relate to society is going to look more like those older forms where, for example, in a village, maybe the village has 30 people and it maybe has 50, it's probably inside of a Dunbar, it's smaller than a Dunbar group, right, for the most part. So when you have some piece of knowledge that is disseminated through it, then what's going to happen is it's going to go very, very quickly. If one person knows something, the whole village knows something, right? Because they're small, because of their scale. We, on the other hand, we have telecommunication, but we have oral telecommunication. So it's much more like living in a small primitive village which just happens to be huge rather than like living in these literate societies like the ones that produced uh you know the works of the enlightenment or the industrial types of like, philosophy that we saw in say the first half of the 20th century which were there was radio there but it was still much more of a literate society than a than an oral one uh so you expect more primitive religion you expect a small divine distance to kind of bring it way, way back. You expect people to engage in religious forms which have a very small divine distance where God is very close to you rather than one where God is very abstract and far away. The idea, like the conception of God as something which is very far away, which is way above you, which is so much bigger and grander than you, easily exists in a literary culture because everything is abstract and everything is linear and everything is far away but mm. in a sensory uh, sense like it's like how I phrase that but in oral culture the God we choose the things like the object from the functional perspective if we look at the functional relation to to the world around us to what I call our integration with being then the gods we pick are frankly people like uh, influencers and politicians who we now see and form these parasocial relationships with very, very close to us. It, as if, uh, take your pick, Ron DeSantis or um, Shoe on Head or any of these people, it's almost as if they're in your home with you when they're on mm -hmm. the screen. Uh, I mean, uh, is Alice Murchak in the room with us right, right now? Right, exactly. They're on my screen. So you might be. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and the conditions of uh, of the modern world bringing us back into a state of, I guess, an oral culture, and this concept of the personal God uh, leads us into uh, kind of the the tension that really is the the guiding piece for uh, Nietzsche and Christianity. Pulling the 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 string of the bow of Western man taught, which is this contradiction and this tension that exists between the urge for self abolishment and the uh, drive for self love. And so, from Nietzsche, we get self love. We get the um, the the uh, the the command to love oneself. And from Christianity, we get this notion of self-abolishment, of redemption through negation of the self. Um, how do these? How does this tension interplay with this concept of the repersonalization of of God? Um, because this was sort of leads into the uh, the final, um, I guess, prescription or or vision that you have for what this Christian Nietzschean synthesis might look like uh, on an interpersonal level. Yeah, so I do not know the answer to that question. Um, and that's one of the, the limitations of this. Like I said, uh, to some degree, I don't think I can possibly answer that question. It's something that you, I say, you have to arrive at individually. And that's why and at the end of my of my synthesis and my and my proposal is look 
here's a contradiction that I think is maybe important and instructive and useful. And what you should try to do is you should try to hold in your head and you should try to live both half of the contradiction simultaneously. And uh, if you do that, I claim, and you can find a way while doing that to also interface with other people who are doing that, then I hope and propose that an answer to this question could be burned to a candidate. And that's kind of the best I can do. Uh, when mm -hmm. I highlight this, this tendency towards the repersonalization of God, again, it's not, it's, it's part descriptive and it's part prescriptive. I, I cannot tell you, you need to conceive of the person of God like this or like that. If I try to put it to where I'm going to, it's going to fail. It's going to come off as kind of parochial and funny and wrong. And maybe you have to go apathetically. Maybe you have to go via negativa. I don't know. And I, I don't have the hubris to pretend to know. So instead, I, what I hope the work achieves is that I can draw a number of lines and show you here are a bunch of things that you need in order to have a successful religious integration that is going to be stable, that is going to work psychologically. And here are the similar lines, some from Christianity, some from Nietzsche. And I don't know exactly where they all intersect. And if you see me trying to tell you where they all intersect, then what you can assume is that I am hard up for money and I'm trying to grip you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so instead, instead, I am trying to show you a geometry and mm -hmm. hope that you can find the intersection yourself. And that's the best I can do. Yeah, well, in a way, you're, it, it's the reintroduction of, uh, of subjectivity, right, uh, into, the, into the religious experience. And it's a very Nietzschean idea as well, this uh, perspectivism. And towards the end, you do talk about some postmodern theory um, that actually is somewhat compatible with this. Obviously, there's a lot of like uh, knee jerk responses to even the word postmodernism uh, on the right, but um, it does it does leave us with a lot of unanswered questions to consider. Um, you said that at the end, this is my vision. Every man, the author of his secret gospel, every man, the high priest of his own home, not one Christo Nietzschean synthesis, but millions. So right. we will leave the audience to ponder what that might mean and how they might uh, formulate one for themselves. Zero, it's been great speaking with you. Uh, happy to have you on again. Um, one last thing before we go, what else can people look forward to from you? I know you've got a lot of stuff coming out. You've been working as well with Passage Press. Uh, the new Passage Prize also is coming. Um, so tell the people what they can expect in the future. I, I wish I could give you a better answer to this. I have um, a couple of projects that I'm really working on. One is uh, a new I'm working on a new series in my podcast, or well, a, a few more episodes. So the plan was always that I was going to get to 10, and then I was going to compile them and re-edit them into a book. So I have, I have four more episodes to go, and uh, they will cover a variety of topics, including the uh, most exciting for me, or at least the topic of women. And what to do about them. I think a lot of uh, people are looking forward to that one. <laughs> I think I think so. I think so. And then on the fiction front, uh, I have been working on a novel for the better part of two years now. And uh, I didn't take a break to write to write podcast episodes. So each episode takes me about a month. Mm -hmm. So you can figure about uh, 20, 20 of the months, me uh, 19. Because I wrote a, a short story, which is coming out in the Bizarre House soon as well. Uh, but about 19 months into this novel, the end, nowhere in sight. If I'm very fortunate, I will finish it in another year. Uh, 
is currently called the Smith and the Devil, and it's going to be on the order, I think, of 100,000, maybe 130,000 words, and it deals with topics such as portals, uh, time travel, and uh, Neuralink, of course, right? eternal fixation. So, again, I don't know when that's coming out. I have a lot written, I have a lot more to write. Um, but I'm very eager to share with everyone when it's finally ready. All right. The Ethereal Zero HP Lovecraft. Thank you, everybody.